everybody, I'm Pilar Gerasimo here with Experience Life Magazine. I'm really excited to be interviewing Dallas Hartwig today. Uh, Dallas Hartwig is a co-founder of Whole9 and co-author of a fabulous new book, in addition to his former book, with Melissa Hartwig called The Whole 30. And this, I don't know if you've seen it, this is our advanced galley, so it's paperback, but the real hardcover thing is a thing of beauty. And it has spent the past six weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It's getting a lot of buzz. It's inspiring a lot of people to change the way they eat and live. And so I'm really excited to have Dallas with us today. Dallas, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, it's my great pleasure. It was real fun to meet you. Initially, um, a mutual friend at the Institute for Functional Medicine connected us and said, the two of you have so much in common and your mindsets and your backgrounds are so similar. Uh, we just hit it off and had a great time talking then. And I realized right away that I would love to introduce you to our whole audience of health motivated people, both because your background is so interesting and your um, passion for sharing what you know and have learned over the past, well, many years and from your own life experience and your professional studies, just seemed like something that would really be a tremendous fit with our audience. Um, so we're really excited to have you on our July cover uh, of Experience Life magazine, where you are um, looking resplendent for our reality check theme. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for doing that, too. Well, thank you for uh, letting me participate. Oh yeah, it's a great it's a great pleasure to find people who really deserve to um, have even broader audiences than they already do, and who can inspire people for something more than six pack abs. We really make a point of putting people on our cover who share our healthy living values and who have something to say. So right. you've got a lot to say, which is why we're talking today. <laughs> I have a lot to say. It's true. <laughs> well, and I know you said only a sum of it in your most recent book and your previous book, which was it starts with food. Um, but the book that you just got out here, the whole third has really made an incredible impact on people. And I know you were just now have come off of what was an extensive national tour to promote it. How are you doing after that whirlwind of promotion and television, radio and all of that? I am alive, thankfully. Uh, extensive is the right word. I forget how many cities and flights uh, we went on. But um, no, the tour itself was, was really amazing. And what's been a lot of fun for us to kind of watch is that there is this sort of very organic kind of grassroots growth process where like things just happen. And, um, you know, we have some, you know, some obviously some publicity support from our publisher. But honestly, the thing that has made this book successful is the fact that everyone tells everyone tells everyone about it. And uh, so much of it is really just this grass, grassroots and word of mouth kind of movement, um, which is just fun to watch because it's not that we have this genius marketing campaign that like makes this this big thing. Like it just sort of happens. And it's, it's fun to kind of be almost a, an observer to that. That's so interesting. I have found that to be true, too. I've heard a lot of buzz about it in my own circles. But while I was working with you on our interview for the cover for the July issue, independently of me, I'd never mentioned it to my niece, Sam Thee. She suddenly volunteered that she and a bunch of her rugby friends were doing Whole 30s and was telling me all about it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know a little something about it. <laughs> yeah. But for people who don't know, who are just being introduced to the concept of the Whole 30, uh, I would love for you to just briefly outline what it is so people have a sense of how it could be become something like a movement. Yeah. So the Whole30 is a, a nutritional reset. So it's a 30-day elimination diet um, that focuses on eating whole, nutrient-dense food products like uh, meat, seafood, and eggs, nutrient-dense vegetables and fruit, and healthy, naturally occurring fats. So really focusing on getting your body optimal nourishment um, and taking out all the sort of modern invented food products and processed foods that a lot of us rely so much on. And uh, it's, then there's a systematic reintroduction after the 30 days of elimination. And that's really where you kind of earn your money, where you kind of get the bang for the buck, because that's when you systematically reintroduce foods that you've eliminated for 30 days and then pay attention to how they specifically affect you as an individual. So we have this generalized elimination program that then becomes very specific and very personal with the systematic reintroduction. And you don't have to take my word for what I think are healthy and unhealthy foods because you get to learn kind of once and for all what foods do specifically to you because there's a huge range of variability person to person as far as food tolerances and what types of foods do really well for you. And that's the opportunity that like once you have that information, once you have that knowledge, you take it forward and like you have that for the rest of your life. So people get really, really excited, um, not just because they learn about how to eat, you know, how to eat healthier in a more sustainable way, but they also really have profound transformations in terms of the way they look, the way they feel, um, you know, kind of uh, reversal or, or stabilization of lots of medical conditions. We've had people, you know, come off all of their diabetes medication, their high blood pressure medication, and 
even though it's not at all a focus of the program, everybody loses weight. So everyone's like, hooray, I lost weight, but so I sleep better and my skin's clear and my energy's better. Um, so it's kind of a win all the way around. Yeah, that's kind of what I've heard is the the stories that people, and this is why I think it's become such an exciting movement, is when people have that kind of transformation and they experience these really significant changes, not just in the way they look, but the way they feel and the way they live every day. I mean, the sleep thing is incredible. People notice and they're like, what are you doing? Like, what's going on with you? And Folks, when they have that positive shift, are usually so excited to share it with other people. I love uh, about the program that it's really consistent with our nutritional philosophy, which emphasizes whole foods and really customizing your diet to understand, um, to help you understand, what, or once you do understand, help you accommodate the fact that your body may have sensitivities to certain kinds of foods. And, um, you know, probably the most common that I see are gluten and dairy and um, nightshades occasionally. And then quirky, weird things that like citrus or something that people would never expect to find out that they're allergic to. Sometimes it takes additional elimination diets. But man, by doing a Whole30, you really can understand very quickly without a lot of expensive lab testing or painful tribulation what works and what doesn't work for your body. So... Right. Well, and to your point, you know, about, um, you know, things like citrus kind of being a relatively common, you know, food allergens or foods, you know, the triggering food sensitivities in people, the Whole30 is not a medical diagnostic diet. It's a freely distributed program, sort of a shotgun approach that hits the middle of the bell curve for the vast majority of people and gives them a really excellent starting point. But it's not the, this is going to fix all of your problems panacea. Um, but our intention in writing this, you know, writing this program initially and sharing it and then writing this book really was giving people the basic foundation that everybody, in our opinion, everyone should go through and everyone should experience. And then if they have additional things they're trying to clear up, then you work with a functional medicine practitioner to sort out some of the real details, the sort of idiosyncrasies. But this is like the basic foundation that everyone really should experience. Well, I mentioned that our theme for July is reality check and and coming to terms with what it is that does and does not work and what may or may not be making you sick and what it actually takes to be healthy, particularly in a world where most of the norms are pretty unhealthy ones, something that we often explain to people is a really challenging thing to face on a daily basis. You know, I think it's important to figure out strategies that can be supportive because otherwise you're constantly running up against these kind of miserable hurdles and you think it's you and people start feeling like there's no way to be healthy. I just, they give up and they get depressed. And, or the other alternative I see is people become obsessed with the pursuit of health and fitness. And they're so determined to achieve a certain kind of um, appearance or identity that they do it at the expense of their health and well-being. And one point that you made in our cover interview, which I just thought was such an interesting insight, is that there's a real difference between looking strong and fit and actually being healthy. And I'd love for you to just share in a little bit more depth your observations about that, because I know you work and live in tribes of people who for whom health and fitness is really a serious and central part of their pursuits, but it doesn't always translate to true health. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, I think about health really as um, the ability to kind of participate in life with no real limitations from a physical, sort of cognitive, emotional standpoint. And what I see with a lot of my functional medicine patients and just people I rub shoulders with kind of in general as they move throughout the world, what I see really are people who understand that fitness is important, understand that exercise and, you know, kind of good diet are important, <coughs> excuse me, and in a really well-intentioned manner, chase that fitness and chase that performance either on the athletic field or court or actually just performance in the gym. And they chase that with really good intentions of being fitter and fitter and fitter because they think it's important, you know, for health. But there comes a, po- comes a point where the kind of health and fitness do actually kind of diverge. And it's not a really clear, there's not a really clear indicator where that point is. And I think people start out really well-intentioned and somewhere along the way kind of lose track of the bigger picture in the, in the really easy way to, you know, fitness is fairly quantifiable, whether it is athletic performance or kind of gym performance, whereas health is a much bigger and, and softer, less tangible thing. So for the things that are easily easily quantifiable, you can say, okay, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting faster, I'm able to do these things in a more quantifiable and, and much more capable way. Cool. I'm going to keep chasing that or I'm losing weight or I'm losing body fat. <clears throat> and those are things that are easily tracked and easily kind of you know seen. Whereas am I getting healthier? 
people kind of sort of scratch their head and say, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, how do you know if you're getting healthier? How do you know if you're healthier now than you were a month ago or a year ago? And I think that's part of it is that people just don't know how to understand what those things are. And the, the, the fallback, the default is falling back on something that is quantifiable, like a lot of fitness metrics or, or body composition measurements, because they know they're correlated, right? We know that people who are severely underweight or severely overweight are typically a lot less healthy than people in kind of a healthy middle range, but it's not synonymous. And that's the thing, the difference between kind of correlation and kind of being synonymous. So a lot of people that I work with, I often will have to kind of rein them back in because the population sort of gravitates towards my message are people who tend to be very um, kind of early adopters, people who are very motivated, very interested in being healthier, being fitter. And often probably 70 or 80% of the time, they're already too far down that point where chasing fitness and athletic performance has taken a toll on their health, either because they're getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go to the gym because it's the only time they have in their busy life or they're training twice a day or be trying to put on muscle mass while losing fat and they're chronically under eating and they're generating this massive chronic stress response, not just as a combination of what they're doing for training, but also the fact that they're kind of not fueling and not nourishing themselves on the recovery end of things. So it's kind of the, the both sides of that, that equation. And a lot of times I have to, most everybody, we take a, take a big step back and say, what are your goals? What's really important to you? And sometimes their goal is athletic performance or sport performance at any cost. And we change gears and we and do that, but with a very clear understanding that this is costing them in terms of long-term health. So really kind of shaking out and clarifying what's most important at this stage in their life is, is, really, is really critical because if you don't know what your goals are, you will never achieve them. So getting people to figure out what's, what is most important right here and now, then can then steer them into, okay, do I want to take a step back from my excessive training and my undernutri- and undernourishing and really start to kind of rebuild my body kind of quickly and structurally? Um, or do I just say, you know what, I've got a big event and training for three months from now and like all systems go no matter what the cost. And there's no wrong answer there. But knowing what that is is, is, a, big, is a big question to answer that surprisingly very few people have stopped and actually forced themselves to answer. Isn't that interesting? I mean, do you do you find that it's just that people get caught up in the excitement or enthusiasm of seeing their body change and wanting to pursue those quantifiable goals? Or is it a mindset that just takes over people and they don't realize that it's costing them as much as it is? I mean, I know I've observed this personally. We live, uh, Experience Life lives within a larger organization called Lifetime Fitness, the Healthy Way of Life company, which originally started out as a very much a fitness oriented company and has right. since adopted a much more health, healthy way of life orientation. But there's an old consciousness that I think lives with, lives within the fitness community that l- presenting yourself as a fit, buff, muscular person is really the thing that counts. And I have seen a lot of people, like you say, overtrain, under rest, under recover, and even just carry on what I call a kind of inflammatory mindset of pushing themselves all the time and not really ever stopping to notice what else is breaking down. And it's not until typically they get their lab tests back from their doctor (laughs) that says, you know, hmm, for all of your fitness, your blood pressure is not great, your cholesterol is a mess, your small particles are wacky, and you have runaway inflammation in your body. And, you know, to get someone like that to rethink from, again, reality check, what am I doing this for? Like, what is, why does this matter to me? I love that that is the central question of what are my goals and why does it matter for me to be this way? Yeah, totally. And I think that, you know, to your point where having something quantifiable, you mentioned lab tests as an example, having something quantifiable there allows people to say, oh, wait, it's not actually really making me healthier. And in the absence of lab tests, which I think are valuable can also be kind of really incomplete as far as giving you a big picture. But that's a a kind of way you can kind of fight data with data. You know, you can have, okay, your, you know, your lip, your blood lipids are way off. Your, you know, you've got, you know, extensive systemic inflammation, things like that, that are kind of data points that you can kind of use it almost as a counterpoint and say, oh, I know that you're 9% body fat and really muscular and you perform well at your sport of choice, but this is the cost. And that, of course, is not solely and directly a, a, a function of their training or the training only, but it's all part of the same story. And lots of times I'll, I'll work with them and say, you know, and, kind of, and nobody really likes to, especially the really fit individuals, nobody likes to hear that things are not really good under the hood. Like, <laughs> yes, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. You know, fitness, 
fitness and health are kind of very confused in the public mindset. And so for people who are, uh, you know, lean, muscular, active individuals who kind of wear this cloak of I'm the health nut, you know, my friends, to kind of pull back the veil and say, actually, like you are lean and muscular, but you're not really healthy under the hood is actually a really emotionally painful for them to confront. And actually, people sometimes get fairly upset with me for sort of saying, hey, like, let's look at this. And P.S., we've gone awry. We've gone off track here somewhere if long-term health is the goal. So there is sort of a, a difficulty in confronting the reality with that data. Because, um, you know, prior to that, all I, all I have to talk to people about is, well, you know, what are your energy levels like? What's your mood like? What's your digestive function like? And some, some of these sort of very subjective things, which sometimes the answers are so apparent, even to the individual giving the answers, that like, they're like, hey, maybe stuff isn't quite right. Um, but absent... Yeah, but absent some data, it's hard to kind of force people to really look at them in the face and say, oh, wow, I'm not, I've, I've gone off track here somewhere. What do I need to do to recalibrate this? Yeah. Well, are there particular questions that you, you just ran down a little list of like, what's your digestion like, you know, skin issues is something else we talked about that people often stuff shows up on their faces or their, the surface yeah. of their body. Uh, are there other questions that you really want to encourage people to ask themselves when they're assessing, you know, where they're sitting in that health and fitness spectrum? Yeah, I think, I mean, I mentioned a couple of them already. Mood is a big one. Um, I talked to people about, you know, do you feel at peace? Are you, you know, are you, do you feel just sort of like good, solid, rested, comfortable in where you are? Do you feel like the world is moving a thousand miles an hour and you can't keep up and you're always behind? Do you have, you know, anxiety? Do you have panic attacks? Do you feel like you have some degree of depression? And things like anxiety and depression are words that we don't really like to label ourselves with. Um, and so, I'll sometimes couch it in different words, but really getting at that same concept because people, there is this sort of still the stigma about mental health and things related to that. So, but if I'm like, you know, Hey, listen, like, are you, do you have trouble getting motivated to get out and see friends? You know, because the social withdrawal component is a key component of, of, uh, of depression. And so if I'm like, Hey, you know, do you find yourself, <coughs> excuse me, not going out of your way to see friends that you used to see a lot more often last year? They're like, yeah, I just don't really feel like it. And then we get talking about kind of how some of that works from a from a mental health, from a depressive standpoint. And I tie that in with some of the, you know, the systemic inflammation that plays a key role in mental health, particularly with anxiety and depression. And then they're like, oh, yeah. And I also, by the way, I also have this like weird skin rash thing that just started about three months ago after I lost my job. And then we kind of really get into this much larger life discussion. Um, but yeah, so the mood is a big one. Um, sleep quality is a big one. Not just do you sleep and do you sleep enough, but do you wake up feeling refreshed in the morning? Do you feel like you fall asleep easily? Um, you know, do you dream? Are you aware of dreams? You know, that kind of thing. Do you have nightmares all the time? Um, do you wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning every single night, almost at the same time with a pounding heart and racing thoughts? Like, and it's actually surprising to me over the years how many people that I know personally who seem to be really high-functioning individuals have all sorts of this kind of stuff going on that no one really knows because they just don't talk about it. They were all hanging on by our teeth to like yeah, the edge totally. of the cliff. Yeah, it's intense. Totally. Um, digestive, uh, digestive function is a big one. You know, do you have, uh, do you feel like you get sort of sour stomach and indigestion after you eat? Do you have intermittent diarrhea, constipation, or both? Um, do you feel like every time you eat a certain food, it makes you feel kind of weird or, you know, those kind of things. And again, there's a ton of people who have some of that stuff. They're like, oh, it's just a thing. And it just becomes your baseline. And that's where something like the whole 30 becomes a really great tool because you kind of give people <coughs> excuse me, this clean slate. And, while it's not, again, not a panacea, it's a really, really useful tool to give people that clean slate to place to start. And then they're like, oh, without, you know, wheat in my diet, I don't really have that chronic constipation that I've had for, thir you know, 13 years. Um, and so it's amazing the long-standing stuff that will just sort of magically, magically resolve itself um, in, in a relatively short period of time just with some simple dietary changes. So that's, yeah. that's a big piece of it. And then I'm, so we talk about the dietary component, which of course is foundational in developing long-term health. And, um, and then like you say, you know, skin is another big one. It's a, it kind of an easily visible, um, kind of reminder of impaired detoxification or certainly the inflammatory response There's all sorts of different ways it can show up. Um, so there's lots of different things you can talk about to people that are mostly very subjective, but it's, it's very rare. I get, I, I start asking some of these questions and like, no, 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 no. I don't have any of that. Um, really what it comes down to is almost everybody's like, yes, no, yes, 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 no. And they have a handful of these things. 
um, which then opens up a, a better, you know, a larger discussion with them about systemic inflammation, balance of the immune system, um, the chronic stress response, which is really the core of all of this uh, long-term health. And then we get to say, okay, well, what's important to you? How are you living your life? What, you know, what value is work and earning money relative to time with your loved ones or recreational activities or whatever? Like, where does that relative value lie? And again, I'm not here to impose my, my personal values on any, and anybody who reads or listeners or, or patients. But if you don't know what those answers are, you're going to do a lot of work that's not going to get you to the place that deeper in your soul you really want to get to. Oh, my gosh. Well, and that leads perfectly into my next question, which was, you know, another piece that we have in the July issue is uh, called Real Bodies in a Virtual World. And it has to do with this, how social media affects people's mm -hmm. perceptions of themselves and how they compare themselves to the endless series of selfies and sp fitspo pictures that they see plastered right. up all over Instagram and Pinterest and Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how, as each of us is, we're pursuing our own path of health and fitness goals or whatever the big why is that we have. But then we go online and suddenly we're hit with this torrent of images and you know slogans and ideals that may or may not be authentic to us, but it's almost impossible to ignore them. So right. our, our piece explores the impact of that a little bit. Um, and I'd love to just hear your thoughts on it because I know you run in circles where a lot of folks are very motivated by that stuff. In fact, a lot of folks produce a lot of it. And I, I know it has sort of a dark and a light side, but I just love your take on it. Yeah, I think, I mean, it definitely does have a dark and a light side. And I think that in most cases, the intention is kind of providing that little kickstart, that little bit of a, like a, you know, tough love kind of approach will often get people who are struggling with motivation um, just to give them just a little nudge and kind of get them rolling. And even the whole 30 itself has some of that tough love embedded in it. And one of the phrases is kind of the most famous, you know, in the, in the whole 30 is like, this is not hard. Kick, you know, beating heroin is hard. Birthing a baby is hard. Drinking your coffee black for 30 days not hard you know and so there is that tough love edge there um, and, and even within that there's a dark and a light side where it's certainly well-intentioned to give people a nudge to kind of get rolling and to kind of frame everything as well wow that's actually not that really big of a deal when you think about the things that people deal with you know in, in kind of larger life struggles and with Fitspo I think I think it's the same situation where you know, if you're having trouble getting motivated to go to the gym or you're not feeling good about something or you're just discouraged because of your lack of progress, sometimes just an image with a, you know, a little catchphrase will really kind of be that like, yeah, okay, cool. I can go do this. I think, and as I see it kind of play out and become a phenomenon over the years, I think it's getting to be a tool that starts to echo some of the real dysfunctions around uh, eating disorders and things that are into their extreme. Um, where people who are already obsessive or compulsive about their behaviors in a very unhealthy way almost use that as a way to pop up those unhealthy behaviors. Um, because you, if, you're looking for, if you're looking for justification to do a thing that maybe you have a suspicion isn't a really healthy thing, but you go looking and you can find all sorts of people who appear to be doing the same thing, you feel a ton better about what you're doing um, because, hey, look, like they're going to the gym even though they only got four hours of sleep. I should be doing the same thing. When ultimately, you probably know that that's not the right thing to do for your long-term health, you know. Um, so there is sort of a self-medication aspect to it, sort of a self-justification piece. The other thing, too, is that you know, it ties right in with society's larger dysfunction about how bodies should look externally, right? It's the judgeable by its cover piece, which, of course, says nothing about health. Um, and so going back to what I was saying earlier, looking a certain way means nothing or very little about your actual health. And so people will chase this appearance of, you know, shapely glutes and lean abs and all this kind of stuff that you see in these images all the time, you know, but really chasing the kind of the aesthetic manipulation piece of it, not the how do I get healthier? Because really, you know, you know, low normal levels of body fat, lots of, you know, lots of lean muscle tissue, good physical capacity and strength and movement quality, all that, all those things are very attractive. They're, you know, produces this kind of this um, message uh, out to other people. They're like, hey, like, I'm a, I'm a good person to hang around because I've got myself together and I'm very physically capable. So there is this sort of, and if you want to get into the evolutionary biology realm, like there is this sort of reproductive message that goes out like, hey, like I'm good breeding stock, <laughs> you know. Um, but even even more more subtly than that is the, 
I'm a capable person because of how I look and that then there, re that reflects on my value as a person. And when I really, and I'm, I have no psychology training, but really getting into some of this stuff with my functional medicine patients, I find that people replace or kind of displace, I guess maybe is the better word, um, intrinsic value and, and thoughts about beliefs about themselves with the way they look and the way they present themselves to the outside world. And they work very, very hard to craft this image that they put out to people, often built around health and fitness, that really is, is a is a proxy for the thing they haven't figured out on that, that deeper level. And that's not a, that's not a judgment because I have no business nor ability to kind of judge that on any individual person. But I do see that and certainly have experienced that in myself as I've grown as a person and understanding like, man, why do I care so much about being lean? Why do I care so much about having six pack abs when I go to the beach? Like, why does that matter to me? And then he was like, well, why does that matter to me? You know, like why? And sometimes people have a really difficult time articulating why that's so important, and they put so much effort into chasing those. But then ask the question of like, well, why does that matter so much? Sometimes people go, blah, 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 blah. I don't really know. <laughs> right, it's a signifier, but I uh, can't get past that. I don't know why. Right. Yeah. Well, again, I think that a lot of us live live our lives largely on autopilot. We're we're doing the thing that we're supposed to do, and we're looking around at other people, and we're comparing their behavior and their appearance and their how much money they have and how successful they are. And we just say, well, we want to keep up and we want to compete with that, or we want to you know be just that just as good as that. But like, we don't really know why. And taking a second and saying, like, wow, what really is important to me, um, often will recalibrate people and like, you know what? It doesn't matter if I have six back halves when I go to the beach. They're like, you know, I'm a 42-year-old mother of three. I have a great marriage. I, you know, have a healthy life. We eat good food. We do lots of recreational activities. We value our family life. And it's cool to look really great. But, like, do I need to get up really early in the morning, you know, and cut my sleep short? to do extra exercise, to burn more body fat. So you can see the abs that I do have. I'm strong and physically capable, but I want you to see them. And if that's the interesting thing, right? <laughs> we chase this leanness piece because we want you to, we want you to see the muscles, like I have the muscles, but I want you to see them by stripping off some of the body fat over them, which is kind of an interesting thing unto itself. It is. Well, and the whole notion that, you know, you can actually be pursuing that goal of being pursued, of having the appearance of fitness. Someone else admires your health and fitness, but meanwhile, right. you're skimping on your sleep and your mental health is suffering to the point that you're now snapping at your husband and kids and all of the okay. things that really matter more to you are suffering. And, and I think too, you know, one thing we really emphasize in experience life is that it's about the whole person, whole life experience experience. And I think you and I agree probably that so much of those of that other realm, the sort of invisible world of thoughts and feelings and relationships gets very short shrift in the conventional mass media. Very much so. But then, you know, you get into this whole question of community, both in the virtual world online and social media and in real communities where people converge around shared goals, you know, in the CrossFit community or at health clubs or even yoga studios, you start getting in with a group of people and it's great. You're part of a healthy tribe, but you can get into their goals and sort of lose track of your own or start, yeah. you, you, you sort of talked a little bit about this in a conversation we had. I thought it was such a neat insight that you can begin pursuing sort of socially supported goals within a tribe in a way that actually works against your own internally held value system. Absolutely. Well, and sometimes it works against your health, but it actually aligns with your values, which is actually kind of one of the funny things. And I see that actually mostly in the endurance sports community. And I see it also in the CrossFit community quite a bit where people have this very supportive tribe to, you know, to use that word. And there's a community support aspect to it there where they're doing, they might be doing something that either doesn't really align with their long-term goals, but everyone around them says, chase performance, you know, run faster, train more, et cetera, et cetera. And you got a group of friends and you're doing it and you're working really hard and it seems like the right thing to do and everyone's encouraging you, kind of egging you on to a certain extent. But at some point, it's not really clear whether that is the right thing to do or not for you. And, um, but at some point, that becomes, uh, becomes a, a problem, becomes an issue um, if it's not really what is important for you. And I think... I used the word self-medication a little bit earlier to talk about the way people gravitate towards behaviors and patterns and tribes of people who kind of echo their own behaviors because it's a great way to sort of justify what you're doing. And people just tend to gravitate toward people who have similar interests anyway. 
But if you're using, and again, I'll pick on endurance sports as a prime example, if you're using running marathons as a way to self-medicate, and I really see this in a huge way where people um, use it as a way to manage their anxiety and don't go for a run, they really have a hard time kind of just being quiet and at peace and they have to train every day or else they kind of start to get a little bit wonky. Um, and they, they use that as a way to kind of self-medicate and, and maneuver throughout their life. And if you find a group of people that does the same thing, and really applauds you for that behavior, then it's a really it's a really easy situation to fall into because you're like, cool, like I like doing this, they like doing this, everyone thinks it's cool, everyone tells me how awesome it is when I do this, I'm just gonna keep doing it. And um, you know, what I see is a kind of combination of two things. I see um, sports or fitness programs degree that develop a large stress response, so kind of a product of intensity and duration of, ex- of exercise. I see it to a lesser degree in the uh, Bikram yoga, the hot yoga kind of approaches that, that you get this additional heat stress from. That. But anything that generates a pretty large stress response and has a really strong community support tends to be prone to those types of things where people love stress response. That buzz feels really good, but it might not be really super good for you because most of us have an excessive degree of chronic stress in our lives anyway, coming, coming everything from sleep restriction, either being sedentary or doing too much exercise. Um, kind of being undernourished, underfed for long periods of time because of our kind of standard Western diet. But then also things like environmental toxicity and impaired detoxification and, uh, you know, heat stress if you're doing something like that. You know, financial stressors, interpersonal stressors are huge and a piece that I think people really, really um, kind of undervalue or underappreciate as a huge contributor to that chronic stress response. And anything that generates that chronic stress response ironically feels pretty good, but then also really detracts from your health. And that's the balance. And that's the conundrum of breaking through the, I know running feels really good when you do it. And I know society tells you that running is a healthy activity, but the motivation and the hormonal response you get from this particular activity isn't actually good for you. And I really have to butt heads with a lot of my clients on that, where they're like, no, wait, CrossFit has to be good for you. Like it makes me stronger. It makes me fitter. I've lost weight. I feel better. I have more energy. What do you mean? It's not the best thing for me. And I, (laughs) people's heads explode sometimes when I kind of break down this concept of the chronic stress response and put it in context for their lives, because the thing that might be perfect and really great in terms of health promotion or fitness promotion for one individual really ends up being a really bad thing, a really detrimental in a different context for a different individual. I think that's where, we make the mistake of not taking our context into account. And we say, well, what's the best training program? And I'm like, for what? For who? You know, um, And being able to, to say, well, for you, with your goals and your context and your life history, this is a really good way. But this thing over here that works great for your friend is a terrible approach for you. Um, and that's really where these kind of large scale generalized fitness programs really fall down in promoting optimal health long term because they don't take any of those individual contexts into account. So for people who are in that kind of uh, confused space or who've gotten realized they've gone down a track of pursuing some goal or some tribally held value and they're seeing that their health is kind of suffering or that their mental health is suffering and they have, you know, answer yeses to those questions. Right. Of, yeah, I'm run down. Yeah, I'm reactive. I'm not sleeping well. My digestive is off. I might have a rash. Where do they begin turning that around? How do you advise them to sort of do a reboot on themselves and their lives in a way that's likely to serve them as individuals? Yeah, I think if you if you go back, you know, I talked about this concept of kind of health and fitness kind of diversion. I think if you kind of backtrack wherever you've gone and you kind of you want to backtrack back to the common denominators, the behaviors and choices that are the basic foundational pieces of any good health and fitness program, um, and you go back to, am I getting enough sleep? Am I eating nutritious food in the appropriate amounts? Am I doing training that is restorative to me, meaning it gives me back more than it takes away? And <clears throat> even just those three basic pieces, and of course, there's a, a ton of other large factors in, in people's lives that m- contribute to their long-term health. But getting back to basics and saying, man, like, am I doing even those basic things? And if you're not, nothing else matters. Supplements you're taking, um, what you're doing for uh, psychotherapy or yoga or mobility or what you're doing for you know social interactions, none of this really matters if you're not doing these kind of really basic human behaviors. Um, and not to minimize the value of any of these other things, but you can run off down the road with um, all sorts of um, really detailed things that are useful tools 
as adjuncts to the basics, not in place of the basics. So it's really like, you know, it, with your computer, when things get wonky, like, what do you do? You like, you restart it, you go back, you know, you kind of plug it, you know, unplug it, plug it back in and start over. And that's really what I think people should do, whether it, whatever their goal, whatever their situation, like get back to those really basic common denominators. And like, am I consistently, he, this is one that I see you know, really often is I see people like, what's the best post-workout recovery formula to maximize my, you know, improvements. I'm like, well, actually it's real nutritious food. And even just framing it as, okay, if you choose uh, the, uh, you know, pro the best marketed protein shake du jour, um, you know, as your, as your post-workout training, if you're doing that five days a week over the course of a year, you're missing out on 250 meals worth of micronutrition that you would have gotten from real nutritious food. And I'm like, wow, 250 meals is an awful lot of meals. Um, an awful lot of micronutrition that's missed. And so we'll sometimes get off track with what's the special supplement or what's the special training protocol or what do I need to do and do I do, uh, you know, coffee with butter in, in the morning to try to boost my fat loss or whatever. I'm like, but you're already chronically underfed. Why would you want to eat more nutritious food from your life? And so there's all of these different kind of hacks and strategies that are kind of promises of shortcuts and promises of kind of the easy way when it really comes down to like am I doing the basic things that make me healthier and more resilient as a human being and then I can start playing around with stuff once I've built this foundation but if I don't have that foundation none of the other stuff is going to make any difference at all yeah I think one of the 101 revolutionary ways to be healthy I don't know which one it is I don't look but is focus on the fundamentals and you know right. we include that because I agree with you completely that people and this is again partially the fault of mass media where we've gone out and thrown every last weird detail and variable we can to people and it's tr trendy this and fad that right. and the new miracle breakthrough whatever and none of it really some of it's fine and it's great and it is helpful as a kind of a incremental improvement once you've gotten all of the other fundamentals handled but i i always advise people to like go back to those basics so i like that perspective and what are the things that you are feeling um are coming and more on top of us that people can begin putting into action now either emerging trends or awarenesses or shifts of perception or just habit that you either see people embracing a la the whole 30 and more whole right. foods based nutrition um, or, you know, in the fitness realm too, or in lifestyle things that are capturing your attention. Well, so, you know, you kind of hit on a couple of the big ones that I think are, are, are fairly obvious. People are increasingly aware of why food matters, you know, not just in terms of nutrition and how it impacts health, but why food matters on a larger like global scale from a sustainability perspective from a how, how does it impact the economics of my local community? How does it impact you know animal welfare? What do we do about factory farming? How do we address that? How do we balance out my own you know uh, personal values, my financial limitations, with the fact that I really hate the idea that animals are abused every day and then sold in the supermarket? Like how do I kind of mix and match? And how do I how do I sort through some of those very conflicting values and and, and conflicting things? So I think people are thinking more about food than they have in a really long time. Um, and it's kind of ironic where, you know, we have more abundance in, you know, in North America than we've, and than we've ever had before in terms of, but we're now thinking about food where, you know, a hundred or 200 years ago, food was just a thing you do. And it was just sort of a part of life. And now like, we're like thinking like, Oh man, like, what do I eat? Like, did I eat too much avocado today? Like, did I have too much, did I have too much dietary fat? And I'm like, it's absurd when you stop and think of it. Like, did I eat too much real food today? You know, <clears throat> and um, and we, but it really is a, it kind of a statement about the way the world is now, where we've become so divorced from really natural patterns and natural rhythms and sort of self-regulating things because of the industrial revolution and the way we've kind of mechanized and automated so many things. Like we've just we now like live on our computers in these very um, kind of structured lives, and like we've just forgotten that like oh like vegetables come from the earth and there's dirt on them, and we get upset if we like you know, buy, you know, buy, veg buy vegetables and there's like a bug on it when it shows up at home. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think they'll probably start really charging know. extra for those now because of the microbiomes popular <laughs> look, right. real life dirt and a bug to boot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think people are getting more involved in their food systems in general, um, whether that is uh, growing some of their own food, getting connected with local farmers, understanding that that is such an integral part of so many aspects of our lives, not just with health, but also with, um, the health of our earth and then, you know, from a, from an economic standpoint, the health of our local economic communities. 
Um, I think the other piece too is that I see people doing a lot more um, what I guess you could call functional fitness. People that, you know, they're getting stronger, they're becoming more physically capable. There's still a strong emphasis on how you look, but I'll still, I'll, I'll, I still count it as progress in that people are, they care more about what their ability to do stuff is as opposed to solely being the focus on how they look, you know, in a bikini or whatever. So I count that as progress. Um, I like to see ongoing progress with, with, with that where there is progressively less and less focus on how people look and more and more focus on just like, what's your quality of life? And, um, what can you actually do? And if you, if your quality of life is really great and you can do kind of whatever you want in terms of stuff, that's a really great place to be. Uh, and if you want to do more stuff, you know, you want to perform athletically at a higher level, you want to be able to do more stuff in the gym. Great. Um, but it also be based on that health foundation. So I see people really expanding the, the, um, the interpretation of functional fitness. Um, and, uh, whether that is they're, deadlifting for the first time and they've never really done that before or they're just really saying oh um you know <clears throat> i can now go for a hike in the mountains and like three or four hours is no problem just at a comfortable pace and i think that's a really kind of a a very subjective um but very simple metric of like hey like do i have a basic level of fitness can i go out and just do stuff without getting wiped out um and i think that's a good a really good thing because a lot of the behaviors and tools and and things around fitness that manipulate the way you look don't carry over very well to real life <laughs> it's hard to photoshop in a hike yeah you know you could yeah you can um you know build bigger biceps and not really be able to do anything more effectively in your real life um whereas if you, you can do pull-ups you can probably do you know kind of the things you need to do for real life stuff and then, and then beyond that if you want to build more muscle mass you want to kind of perform athletically go ahead by all means chase that so that's that's another thing that's really encouraging me is to see people really getting on board with that, that whole functional fitness piece. Um, and there's a thousand different ways to do them to do it really well. Um, and I think that as long as you're keeping an eye on the fact that uh, chasing that indefinitely to the most extreme application is not going to be healthy, definitively not healthy. And as long as you understand that at some point there is that divergence that happens, um, I think it's a really encouraging. Thing. I think that makes the world a better place and it makes people healthier in general long term. Well, I'm all for that. And yeah, that's very consistent, I think, with our hope and our worldview is that the more people focus on the bigger picture of how they want to feel and show up and be in their lives and in the world around them, the better things go. And the more moderate people are, I mean, you can still be passionate about your pursuit of health and fitness, but it's a, it's a more informed pursuit. Um, and speaking of pursuits, I know that now that you're off this book tour and you've got yet another best-selling book behind you, you're also planning to shift your your life and your life efforts in some new directions. And I'd love to have you share a little bit of what you see on the horizon and the areas where you want to be focusing more yourself. Yeah, so I, I've always come from this kind of this broad, this kind of very broad um, health focused perspective. Um, you know, I, I played high level volleyball through my 20s, even then still cared about being healthy. Um, and and it, you know, even the athletic performance didn't totally take over my whole life. And so in building, um, in building whole line, which is the kind of the method, the, the, the program, um, the thought process um, that where the whole 30 grew out of, it's even that reflects kind of personal values and my beliefs about how to kind of live this healthy, balanced life and address all of these different factors in your life. And Dallas, for people who don't know what Whole9 is, because yeah. I know Whole30 is really out there because of the book and the program, but Whole9, sort of the parent, you know, organization that launched Whole30, right? Yeah. So Whole9 is, is um, you know, is our company name, but it's also really the method um, to describe the way you could live in addressing lots of different factors in, you know, in healthy living. So I'll see if I can get these nine. There's nine factors. That's why we call it whole nine. Uh, let's, here we go. Uh, nutrition, uh, sleep, healthy movement, socialization, um, natural environment, fun play, personal growth, temperance, and there's another one. <laughs> You have to say, you did that really well. I did not give you any setup that that was going to happen to you, and I didn't plan it. So that's great. Well, you get the sense, though, right? It's like a whole 360-degree yeah. view of a human and their life, and it's nine big factors. We'll come up with the ninth one, I'm sure, and add it to our list at the bottom. <laughs> but really, so that's the that's the, the kind of way to say, okay, what are all the, all the things that matter in terms of kind of healthy living and having this balanced life? And nutrition is a really foundational piece, which is why we wrote a book called It Starts With Food. And then 
the whole 30 book really was the growth of people saying, man, I was really excited from reading It Starts With Food. I loved your introduction of the whole 30 program, but I need more help. I need more guidance. I need more tools to really be successful at that. And that's really what people clamored for this book. And we wrote it really as an answer to what people were asking for. But my personal interest now is kind of going back to the start and taking a step back from this focus on nutrition and looking at the larger lifestyle piece and saying like, how do we, how do we live a healthful, balanced life in this crazy, crazy modern world that we have? And, you know, how do we do it without necessarily, um, you know, going off the grid and living in a commune with no internet and no running water and like living, you know, kind of settlers would, um, is there a way we can balance up, those basically? I think that's so funny that that's like totally my thing. I'm like, well, I know I can do it, but I don't know if I want to do it that way. <laughs> Right. And, and that's the thing is I think there, I think there is a, a balance there. I think there is a happy medium there where we can use some of the amazing tools, uh, you know, the modern tools are available to us. But the thing that is interesting, and I think the internet's a good example. Um, you know, Nicholas Carr wrote in his book, The Shallows, he wrote about, you know, the medium becoming the message and kind of taking over and just becoming the thing itself. And um, I spoke to my massage therapist yesterday and she said, um, next week I'm, I'm, I'm killing the internet at home. She's like, I'm not, I'm taking it away. And she said, I called the company and I was like, I want to discontinue internet service. And they're like, oh, which company are you switching to? And they were, and she was like, no, no, I'm, I just don't want it. And they were like, what do you mean you don't want it? You know, and so I think people are, because things are getting to this kind of this critical mass and just saying like, you know, modern medicine is not doing a very good job of keeping, you know, keeping me healthy. Um, the food system's totally gone awry. I think people are starting to kind of realize in the back of their minds, in some cases from a sort of a, an experience of crisis, that like, things are wrong. We've gone off track here somewhere. And what do we need to reassess personally and as, you know, on a, on a society wide um, kind of scale? How do we, how do we sort some of this stuff out? And um, that's, those are the questions that I really want to answer is how do we, um, how do we integrate the availability of incredible resources and technologies while still integrating that with ancient rhythms? What are kind of our genetic predisposition will kind of expect, if you want to use that word, like how do we how do we marry those two things without going so far away from um, from what our, our bodies and our genes really expect, such that we develop um, essentially pathological lifestyles um, as a result of embracing all the new you know modern technology. So balancing those things is something I'm really interested in. Um, I'm doing a lot more research on that. I'm do do more writing on that in the future. Uh, I'm working on developing a podcast to address some of those topics. Um, so my content manager made a point to me earlier this year. She's like, look, like you're a competent writer. She's like, you can write, but she's like, you're a much more competent speaker. And she's like, you really need to start expressing some of this to people verbally. So I'm like, okay, cool. So we're working on developing a podcast, which I'm really excited about to kind of talk about some of these issues. How do we live healthfully in the modern world? That is a profoundly important question. And, you know, I really, I consider you a fellow revolutionary and a partner in, in the asking of those big questions and the seeking of those answers. And I think just including people in conversations, which is really as humans where we've always found our best answers and lessons, you know, in community with each other. So I really am excited to hear about what you're working on next. And like I said, really happy to have you as part of our family and experience life and on our cover of the July reality check issue. And um, I hope we'll get to do more together and um, get out there and do more of what you're doing. Give it. It's so great. And I think it'll be really inspiring for folks that have been struggling with some of those well, very questions. Well, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm honored and thankful to be kind of uh, participatory in this. And um, I hope the dialogue continues. Yeah, me too. Well, where can people find you in the meantime, if they want to connect with you online or in social streams? So a few different places. Um, I'm on Instagram at Dallas Hartwig. I'm also on Twitter at Dallas Hartwig. Um, I will be launching uh, a new website to kind of address some of these issues um, later this month, which will be DallasHartwig.com. Um, so really kind of getting into this is sort of a, a changing of gears for me and really kind of going back to the start and thinking about some of these really big pictures, um, these really big um, approaches that are kind of a little different than what I've done in the past. Um, so new platforms, new content, and, and stuff that I'm really excited about. That's fantastic. Well, we'll make sure to include the links down where people can find them associated with this video. And of course, people can find out more about you with um, our on the cover profile of you in the July issue of Experience Life, which will also be available online and in our fabulous new digital edition. So people can enjoy it in its glory. It's a uh, 
retina display glory on the iPad. It's quite something. Nice. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, good luck to you in all of that. Congratulations on the success of your new book, The Whole 30. People have not already picked up their copy. I encourage them to do so. It is really a tremendously practical guide on how to embrace the Whole 30 experience and really just begin living in a way that is more supportive of your larger goals in life, assuming you want to be a healthy, happy person. That's a great way to start. And uh, we'll look forward to following you more, but uh, come back and talk to us again soon, okay? I definitely will. All right, thanks, Dallas. Take care. Thanks, Dora. Yeah.